So this week, um, as you may have noticed, that the recorded lecture did not happen. And uh, as I <coughs> contemplated uh, recording it after the fact, as I ran into some difficulties over the weekend, uh, the bulk of the lecture is actually uh, focused on pulling out of the documentation for open layers a few key options. Um, but otherwise, I was pretty much going to be reading through the stack of slides, <laughs> uh, highlighting those options, uh, many of which um, we'll actually see, we saw either in the demos last week or in the demos this week. So what I recommend is reading through the lecture notes um, for the descriptions of each of those options as they are either um, for the definition of essentially the map object or layer objects as, a, as a, essentially a taste of what you can do in open layers to tune up or tweak how those maps or layers will be displayed or how they'll um, behave in the open layers uh, mapping interface. Before I start going through a demonstration of the two sample um, open layers maps for this week, um, first, I just wanted to ask if there are any questions coming out of the milestones or the work that we've been doing since spring break. Let's see. Not that one. That may be a little bit easier to see. <laughs> uh, so, any questions? If not, um, as I mentioned last week, hopefully uh, you've been noticing the similarities um, in many respects especially conceptually, between the work you were already doing in Google Maps and uh, conceptually mapping those concepts over into open layers. Um, one of the things that um, I'll also try to talk about today is uh, some of the issues that you may very well likely run into when it comes to map projections, because that is one of the issues that typically arises at this point is you're starting to um, work with additional sources of data to bring into your maps and you start running into uh, issues related to uh, coordinate systems um, because open layers does provide a lot of options and as a result more opportunities for things to uh, go awry. Uh, with that, there are two um, demos that I want to walk through uh, today. And these are the links from the, uh, the web page representation of the lecture notes. If we uh, go down to the uh, WMS layer configuration section of the lecture notes, there's a sample provided on the, on the, uh, in the browser. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So it's a little more visible. And when we're talking about adding a, an OGC WMS layer to an open layers map, the first thing you're going to be looking for is creating, starting to essentially create a new open layers layer object of the type WMS. So this is telling open layers that essentially the source for the map images that, um, that are going to be used for this layer are going to be coming from a remote web map service or OGC web map service. As a part of that, you provide a name for that layer. This is the name that would show up in that layer picker if you have it enabled as a part of the uh, map interface. You provide the link for the base request to that web map service. So this is the exact same web map service link that we've been talking about in the context of reading those get capabilities responses that we get from any web map service that you were working with before the break, where this is the base of the, of the link to the service to which all of those other WMS parameters would be added that version and service and B box and SRS or CRS, depending on the version of the, of the service, the layers, all of that stuff that is required to actually generate a valid WMS request gets tacked on to the end of this base URL 
that you need to provide as a part of your definition of a WMS layer. Then you have this, what's called a dictionary, this JavaScript dictionary of names and values. They come in pairs that are specific values that you want to set that are going to be passed as a part of the WMS request. So, for example, if a WMS service supports, you know, a dozen layers, you have to specify at least one. But it's up to you to determine what layers you want to request. So just like when you were composing those WMS get map requests as a part of your, your previous work with WMS, where you have to specify the names of the layers in that map service that you want to be in that generated map, you have to provide that information here as a part of the layers, um, the list of layers. You just separate them uh, by commas within the quotes. So in here I just have one, counties, but I could have multiple layers that I'm requesting from this particular web map service. If the service supports multiple versions, you can specify what version you would like. You can also specify the transparency, true or false. Again, these are the exact names of the parameters that are a part of the WMS standard. So these are the same named parameters that you would be assigning values to in your request if you were going to write your own get map request to that remote server. We then have a second dictionary, the second set of values that are within, between the curly brackets that are the options for the layer, for the, the open layers layer that we're creating. So this is where the various options that I was highlighting in the lecture notes come into play in terms of, in this case, I'm, you, I'm uh, including this is base layer. So this basically de defines whether or not this layer is going to be a base layer in the map interface that open layers is providing. So as I was talking about last week, there is that area in the layer picker where you have the radio buttons where you can choose one layer or another or another, and that's labeled as base layers. This is a way to tell open layers whether or not a given layer that you're adding is or is not a base layer, whether it should go up into that top area. Otherwise, if it's not a base layer, it's a layer that can be optionally displayed and it's going to show up as one of those that with a checkbox next to it that you can optionally turn off and on. And, you, and it would be part of that set of layers that you can turn multiple layers on as well. So in this case, is base layer false means that this is not a base layer and instead it's going to be treated as a layer that the user can turn off and on in conjunction with a bunch of other layers that can just be turned off and on using the check boxes in the layer picker. Um, in this case, we've also added the visibility false. That means that when the map initially loads, this layer will not be turned on. It will show up as a layer that can be displayed in the layer picker, but the check box is essentially unchecked. This layer will not show up by default. If you say visibility true, that means, as you might expect, that that layer is going to be turned on by default. That, you know, that, me that doesn't mean that the user can't turn it off, but, but it's going to be displayed automatically when the map loads. And there's also, this is just one of the other more interesting options, you can set the opacity for a layer. So essentially how opaque that layer may be so even if it's, if it's uh, you know, a filled polygon, you can actually make it semi-transparent. And what Open Layers does is it actually uses styles in the browser to take the solid images that are returned by the map server and to make them somewhat, somewhat transparent. As a result, you're a little bit dependent on the browser and how it supports that transparency of, of content in the web browser but it works in most of the current web browsers. Um, and I have an example of that in, in uh, one or both of these in terms of layers that have uh, multiple uh, op opacities set. 
So this is lines one through six, a complete definition that will work for a given WMS layer. There are a lot more options that you can specify, and this is where looking through the documentation and experimenting with those options can be a, a useful exercise. Having created the layer though, just like any other layers that we've been working with starting last week or even in Google Maps, we have to then actually add that layer to our map. And that's what this second command here is. Create the layer, add the layer. Okay? That's a common pattern. So now let's look at an actual example that brings in a variety of WMS layers from a remote server. And I was going to see, okay, good, it looks like I'm on the internet. So here is, here is a map that includes a variety of layers, including essentially three base maps coming from, well, it's two or three different uh, sources. Um, the first to the U.S. Imagery Tile Service and the Global Countries and Oceans um, both come from different USGS services. So they're different USGS services, but they're all from USGS. That's why I said sort of three. <laughs> um, the third one actually comes from a completely different organization that is focused on a global bathymetrics chart. So if I choose that one, it's a different base map that I can bring in. Um, or I can bring in this second one from USGS that's a largely sort of blank map that just shows essentially uh, country boundaries and, and oceans. So these are my base layers. Um, I then have options for additional non-base layers that can be turned off and on. So I can turn on <laughs> labels. And you can see there are these kind of crappy looking labels that show up over the oceans at this point. As I zoom in and out, those more or fewer layers are going to show up as this particular service controls essentially the scales at which different labels will appear or disappear. Um, the counties from the U.S., this is coming from USGS, um, tribal lands, and U.S. federal lands. So these are all services. In this case, uh, the, these last three are also hosted by USGS. And we're just bringing them in as available layers in the map. So how do you add a legend for the U.S. federal lands? Aha. That actually is um, a separate request that um, many maps, web map services support called a get legend graphic request. If you look in the capabilities response for any of these services, you, um, if it supports a get legend graphic request, it's going to show up in the top area where it's talking about the different requests that are supported and the base URLs associated with those requests. And um, then the, for each of the layers, there's going to be information provided as well about how to get essentially a graphic that represents the legend. How you handle that graphic is, is another thing altogether. Um, so, and, and, and how, how the different web map services sort of render those legend graphics varies from service to service. But there is a function in WMS for requesting a legend graphic that you can use typically as the raw material for generating a legend that you would show in your interface. Otherwise, and this is, the, to be honest, this is often the case um, it, when you're doing sort of a production map where you know what layers you're going to be adding, you can actually look at and under, once you understand how those maps are rendered, it's often better and cleaner to build your own legend in a graphics program where you have control over the typography and the, the colors and the, you know, basically the layout of, of the legend elements where you, can, you may build a single legend that represents you know, all of the layers that you have in your map that is you know, a, attractive and useful. Where otherwise you'd be sort of gluing together the legend graphics that may be provided by multiple services in slightly different ways 
So for a production uh, map, you may find yourself generating your own, your own legend, but the get legend graphic is, is there as, as an option as well. And that's just another request that you submit. This is what the map looks like. Let's now walk through the source code for it. Is that legible back there? Yeah. OK. We have here then our um, basic uh, setup for uh, creating our map. We have here in line 7 through 19, I'm setting up uh, a, a set of global variables. Um, again, reiterating this from last week, these global variables um, are important to set up outside your initialization function because in, in some instances, if they're only created inside the initialization function, those variables go away after that initialization function stops running. So some of the interactivity with the map um, and with those layers can sometimes break. So it's, it's useful to actually define outside of the, um, of the initialization function, um, particularly uh, your uh, projection information, um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second, um, your map object, and, vari and your layer variables. So again, that gives them persistence um, throughout the life of your web page, as opposed to just during the, um, the execution of that initialization function. Here, we then start our initialization function and we create our map object. In this case, we are um, setting a single option for that map object. We're setting the projection to this my projection variable that is defined up here. Um, setting up your projection information up here in, in your set of global variables is a nice way to separate from your code some of the things that you might end up wanting to change or quickly look at instead of having to dig through your code. By setting it up in a variable up here, you can just refer to it by name and uh, in the later part of your code. In this case, we're setting our, our projection to EPSG 4326. This is your standard geographic latitude and longitude projection. This is the point at which we need to think about the projections supported by all of the services that we are including in our map. So when we talked about base maps last week, whether it's Google or OpenStreetMap or Bing, all of those base maps support one coordinate reference system. That's that web mercator or spherical mercator coordinate system variously uh, uh, historically uh, represented by EPSG 900913 as I mentioned to you last week or alternatively the 35 something 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 <laughs> that I can never remember. Uh, <laughs> bottom line is that when you're creating a map and you're tying into data sources that may be based in different coordinate reference systems you have to think long and hard about whether or not you can even include all of those layers in a single map. Because you can, if you're trying to use, say, a web map service that only supports 4326. A quick question, where do we learn that? In the Git Capabilities section. Exactly. So if you want to know, whether or not a given web map service that you want to use can be, say, added to a map that's using Google or OpenStreetMap as a base map, you need to look at the Get Capabilities response for that service and see whether or not that 900913 or that other numeric EPSG code that I can never remember <laughs> is supported by that web map service. If it is, you're good to go. If it's not, you're not. <laughs> you cannot combine those data in a single map. 
because you can't reproject Google's stuff and you can't, re you can't request the map images from a service in a coordinate reference system that is not supported by that system. So that's, that's probably the biggest um, challenge that you'll encounter as you're trying to bring in data from any external services and overlay them on one of these base maps. And I, I know there are, are those of you who can attest to this. <laughs> um, so you have, to, you have to be very conscious about the base maps. That's one of the reasons why, in this particular example, you'll notice I'm not using any of those commercial base maps as my base map here. Because that actually limited my ability to show some of these other layers that I wanted to um, as a part of the map. So in this case, we've got our, uh, our map projection is EPSG4326. We're defining a variable called my, my projection here on line 11. And then we're setting the projection for our newly created map object here, projection colon my projection. So I'm pointing to that projection uh, definition by name by referring to this variable name created up above on line 11. That makes sense? Okay, now we start adding our WMS layers. And I tried to add at least enough documentation into this so, so that you would know where the data are coming from. When you're adding WMS layers to your system, it's not a bad idea at all to add a comment to your layers or your groups of layers that have the link to the capabilities request so you can very quickly as you're working from your source code, copy and paste that into a browser to do a get capa capabilities request against that service um, to double check to see if it's changed or if something's not working or if you've forgotten what projections they support um, is just helpful to have that near at hand. So we have this comment here on line 25 that's doing exactly that. And then on line 26, we're starting to create this WMS layer. And with that, we're giving it a name. In this case, I'm naming it US Imagery. This is probably also a good point to highlight the benefits of actually using um, informative and useful variable names. Um, I've provided you a lot of examples uh, you know, using classroom locations and things like that. Um, I use those variable names because they actually refer to classrooms or offices. Um, I strongly encourage you when you're writing your own code, even if that code may be based on my examples, go ahead, go wild, create some of your own variable names uh, and make them descriptive so that you can actually read your code and understand what a layer is. So in this case, you know, this is actually a a, a web map service that is providing imagery for the US. So I thought US imagery would actually be a variable name that I can read later and have an understanding as I'm reading my code that w of what that, what that layer represents. Just like in the notes, I'm then assigning to that this new WMS open layers layer object. And for that layer object, I'm defining a name Again, this is the name that's going to show up in the layer picker. I'm providing that base URL that also would come out of the get map section of the get capabilities uh, response, that XML file. This is one of those areas where USGS is incredibly annoying um, and, it, and it may actually be the automatic uh, scheme that ESRI uses uh, when it's publishing OGC services, where the USGS layers are numbered, which is actually illegal um, according to the standard, where you cannot actually have a layer name start with a number. But the clients tend to uh, be tolerant of that sort of uh, deviation from the, from the standard. So if you read the capabilities request, you'll find that the particular imagery service that we want to work with has a layer name of zero. So that's, 
the layer name that we're providing here. We're telling it what version of the WMS standard we're wanting to use. And we're specifying here that we want this to be true. This information is used by open layers to actually build its own get map request based on the current, essentially the zoom and bounding box for the map window to generate requests for individual map tiles. Because you may have noticed as open layers loads, you see those individual map tiles loading into the client interface. Each of those is a separate WMS request. And so, uh, you know, when you load that map, you may think of it as the map reloading. It's actually reloading a new set of tiles or additional tiles if those tiles have already been, you know, because some of those tiles may have already been downloaded as you scroll around because those tiles are consistent when you're zoomed in at a particular level. Um, all of this information is used by open layers to compose those individual web map service uh, get map requests that return those individual tiles. This transparency allows uh, uh, open layers to actually layer those on top of each other. And that's why, you know, in contrast to what you see in Google Maps, where when you include, say, a KML layer or you include markers, what you're doing is you're essentially sending that information to Google servers. And Google servers are then developing composite map images or tiles that get sent back to the interface for visualization. But those are, they sort of flatten all that stuff into a single map image, where here, Open Layers is actually layering all those images on top of each other um, as a part of the tiles that are being displayed. So when you're requesting, map images from multiple web map services and you have those layers turned on, this transparency thing becomes important. And the order of your layers becomes important. Because if you have, for example, an imagery service that you can imagine that that is completely opaque, and if that is the last non-base layer that you load into your map, it's going to obscure everything else. It's going to hide everything else behind its opacity. So you need to think about the order that you add your layers in, and you need to think about this transparency. The transparency um, that you specify um, also is a cue to open layers to try to request a, a file format that actually is that supports transparency. We talked about this quite a while ago. PNG and GIFs support transparency, JPEGs do not. Um, you can actually specify a format as a, one of these WMS options as well. So if you want to be explicit saying, no, request a JPEG or no, request a PNG, you can do that as one of the options here. Just, it, you know, it's format, colon, and the name of the format that you want to specify. So if Open Layers is having a hard time requesting a map image or it's requesting a map image type that you would prefer it requested another one, you can be explicit by adding that format colon and the name of the format that is supported by that WMS as one of the options for that layer. Okay? You had a question? Yeah, I was thinking about transparent versus visibility. Mm-hmm. Visibility basically but it sets the default of whether or not a layer is going to be turned off or turned on in the map. So if we go back to our map here, these checkboxes are essentially toggling the visibility of a layer. So it's either visible or it's not visible. You set the default value for any layer using this using the visibility option, which I think I have, yeah, down in, down in one of these other layers here. So that's, that's so you're, it's either turning it off or on. Transparency is whether or not essentially the background of a map image should be rendered as transparent. So if you think of a road network, that road network has essentially colored pixels where the roads are, then it's got a lot of background. If you request a transparent version of that road network, 
It should be delivered in a, number one, in a format that supports transparency, but also where all of those non-road areas, those areas that aren't colored as roads, would be rendered as transparent so that you could see through that image. So that's this transparency issue. And whether it's, you know, and that's a standard WMS consideration, but it plays out particularly strongly in these client applications where you may be layering multiple WMS images on top of each other. Because that's what Open Layers is doing is it's stacking these returned map images from these separate services like layers on top of each other. And the transparency or opacity of those layers controls what is displayed underneath or what is visible to the user underneath. So stacking and transparency play a key role in what you can see and what, what the user experience for the map is going to be. Okay? Um, and in this case, the, uh, the countries layer is set to, uh, or actually we were, we were first talking about this, uh, this imagery layer. We're setting this to true. So this is then putting this US, US imagery tile service USGS layer in the top part and under this base layer section of our layer picker. So it's one of those layers that basically is, um, you can only choose one at a time. A common model is that any of those completely opaque layers that you want to display are often designated as base layers because they don't serve a lot of good if they're sort of in the middle of a stack of other layers because um, they're going to obscure whatever is below them. So that's just a common practice for any of these layers. If it's opaque like these imagery layers are, then um, it's likely you would designate it as a base layer as I did here. So this is the definition of that web map service layer and then I'm adding it to the map. We now have a second one that we're calling countries layer. We're creating it as a new open layers layer WMS layer type. We're giving it this name global countries and oceans. We're pointing to the base URL. And in this case, I'm adding a bunch of layers because after reading the capabilities document and attempting to interpret the incredibly vague descriptions provided by these layers, this seems to be the set of layers that represent the boundaries of countries and oceans at a variety of scales. So they've actually uh, built into their service uh, definitions of the scales at which different representations of country boundaries would be displayed. And so as I zoom in and out on a map, I wanted to make sure that I would be able to get the country boundaries at least acro across the range of scales that are represented. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I added all of these layers here. But there's a more general principle here in that you can request multiple layers from any r remote web map service to essentially create your own composition of a combination of those layers that's going to then be returned into open layers. So just like you can lovingly handcraft that get map request to uh, layer a set of individual layers together into a single map image that is returned by uh, a, a WMS service, that's exactly what you're doing here by specifying this combination of layers provided by that service and the order of those layers in that list. Because any WMS is actually going to take this order of the layers that you request into account in terms of how it stacks them. Addressing that same question of sort of opacity and transparency and, and, and you know, basically visibility of layers. We're specifying a version. We're saying that we want you know, to request this as transparent, where in this case, since it basically is all, all the pixels have values, this transparent doesn't have any real material effect, but um, we're including it nonetheless. And we're also defining this as a base layer. Then we're adding it to the map. Make sense so far?
because there's a lot more of these. <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully the pattern is starting to emerge. Got a name. We're creating this new WMS layer. We give it a name that shows, shows up in the picker. We point to the base URL for the service. We specify the layers, the version, transparency. Now we do have a variation on the theme with this particular layer. And this is something that you encounter, especially when you're dealing with layers that have labeling. So an example of that would say be a highway layer that has highway symbols or that has labeled city locations. Quite often in well-designed web map services, they will separate the labels from the underlying map information. And that's a very helpful thing when they do that because I was telling you earlier about the tiling that Open Layers does. So while it looks in the interface like a single map image, if I zoom out or zoom in, let me see if I can force it. Well, you can sort of see the tiles coming in as it, as it reforms the map. It's a little too quick to notice. But each of, these, each of those tiles is a separate WMS request, as I described earlier. If you have features that are labeled, often the server is going to be labeling those features for each map image that is requested. So if we've got nine tiles as a part of this composite map that we're looking at, we could end up with essentially labels on every tile for the same interstate. So every 256 pixels, we might have another label for the same feature on the map. That's quite often not the effect you're looking for. Um, when it comes to labeling, you often want to let the server do the thinking about where those labels should be placed and how they should be placed and that place and that calculation is usually done in the context of an entire map image. Well, when we're talking about these individual tiles being requested, every request is a new day. Every request, it's going to optimize the label placement within that single tile, but that means that you're likely to get a very cluttered map. A way around that is to explicitly tell open layers to request a single tile. So that's this option here for this, this particular WMS layer. So in spite of the fact that this is actually a less efficient way to request map data from a remote server, it's absolutely the way you want to do that request if, that, if you're getting that you know, labels on multiple tiles problem. You want to let the server do the work of positioning labels within the context of that larger map image as opposed to doing it for each of the tiles. And it's with this option, single tile true, here on line 48, that you can specify that. So that's something to keep in mind as you're thinking about layers that represent labels. You may want to exercise the single tile option. Also in this layer, we've set visibility to false, meaning that that layer should be turned off by default. We now have our, our third base map, this Gebco layer. Same thing, setting up the WMS, setting up the name of the layer that shows up in the picker, the base URL, the name of the layers, the version, the transparency, whether or not it's a base layer and adding it to the map. You know, wash, rinse, repeat. Over again and over again for any of the, any of the layers that you want to add. I had originally been trying to add some of the satellite imagery collections from NASA's Earth Observations web map service. It's actually a great service when it responds. <laughs> for a vast array of uh, NASA satellite images. Um, 
It was not playing well when I was putting these demos together, so I just commented it out. Um, by the way, that's a, that's a handy trick when you're editing your, your stuff, your JavaScript or anything else, and if you want to make something go away without deleting it, you can just use the JavaScript comments, which are just these two uh, hash marks at the beginning of a line, and JavaScript will ignore everything past those hash marks. Um, you can do the same thing, actually, you can put comments at the ends of lines just by putting those hash marks in. It'll ignore everything af after those. So that's a way, in this case, I just basically disabled this block of code while still leaving it in place for future use, reuse, reference, whatever. So you added those kind of automatically. You hide it, highlighted all the lines and then you did something that... Yeah, that's, that's the particular editor that I'm using that has that feature. Um, so it's going to vary from editor to editor in how you enter them. But they can just be typed in. <laughs> so then we start adding the rest of our layers. In this case, um, these are all from the, uh, the USGS National Atlas web map services in terms of county boundaries, um, the boundaries for the Indian lands, and the boundaries for federal lands. And it's the same process. The one thing that I'll highlight here is all of these are set as is base layer false because we want to provide the user with, with the option of enabling one or zero or more of those layers because they can turn all of those layers off and just look at the base map. Or they can enable any or all of these layers. And those are, again, the ones that show up now here under the overlays area of the layer picker with the checkboxes. Okay? So that's the difference between base layers or base layers and non-base layers essentially. And uh, that's about it. In this case, you'll notice that I actually have a simplified map set center command here compared to what we had been doing um, in the previous examples. The reason for that is that in the previous examples, we were not working in this EPSG 4326 projection. So we were needing to use that transpose function for that open layers latitude longitude object that we have to pass to this set center function to recenter our map. We had, to, we had to essentially transform from the geographic latitude longitude values that I was providing to the native units of the 900913 coordinate system that's used by, say, OpenStreetMap. In this case, I actually am providing longitude and latitude values here. And since those are the native units in degrees of the projection we're working in, I can just use them sort of naked here in this set map center function. So that's why this is actually a much simpler representation as for the content of that set center function than we were seeing before as we were defining those coordinates in geographic latitude longitude, but we were needing to conform, uh, convert them into the meters of that global um, sphere, uh, web mercator coordinate system. Okay? So any questions about that? Okay, so let's move on to the second example. Where did that go? I think I need to go back here. Where we can talk about uh, vector layers. And in the notes, there are a number of uh, uh, screens or pages of information about options for configuring vector layers. Bottom line is that you have a number of geometry types. And we see some, um, uh, an example here of actually working with the point type where we first are actually creating a point this is a point object that you can then use as the raw material for creating a new vector object. 
So in this case, I'm using that same sort of conceptual separation of uh, some of these, these commands to create, say, a coordinate. I'm, in this case, I'm creating a point. And then using that to, it, by name, so I'm creating this variable called coordinate classroom. And I'm creating this new open layers geometry object of a point type and passing it a, um, a uh, longitude and latitude. I'm then using that point object to define this new vector feature. So this feature is actually something I can map. That point is just a reference to a location in space. A point is what you use to create a node in a geometry, in a feature, but, uh, but prior to that, it's just a point and not a mappable point. It's just a two-dimensional value representing a location. It's only when we use it to create this vector feature object that we actually have something that we can um, add to a layer and display. So in this case, I'm creating this vector feature and giving it this name point classroom. So now I can refer to that feature by name. And I can now add that feature to a layer. So in the example, you'll actually see that I create the layer, I create the layer itself previously, and a feature is a part of that layer. Just like when you're working in any geographic information system, you can add multiple polygons or multiple points to a shape file, to that geographic uh, shape uh, file. Your, fe your layer is essentially that collection of features. That layer may contain one feature, it may contain 10,000 features. Here we've created one feature, a point, and we've added it to this layer called, uh, in this case, it's a, it's a layer that's part of a collection of layers. And that layer is named within that collection local features. So I'm using this add feature function to essentially append this new point feature that I just created to that layer. We can do it more simply by just creating a named layer and, and adding the feature to that named layer. This is a slightly more complex way to do it, just like in that, in that final example that I was providing for um, Google Maps. There is a way to sort of create a collection of, of Google Maps layers that you can sort of treat as a unit. That's a similar model that I'm using here. Um, so that's, that's the generic uh, conceptual model for adding these, uh, these features to layers and creating those features from scratch. Another type of, of, uh, of vector uh, layer that you may want to add is based on a KML file. We talked about KML files a while ago as um, being potentially very useful as a data exchange and access system. We also talked about some of the challenges in KML in that KML is based on XML. XML is very verbose. Um, X, uh, KML files uh, can contain complex geometries and that verbosity of XML combined with complex geometries can produce very large KML files. You have to think about the size of a KML file that you're bringing into your map. Google, Google Maps, if you try to add a KML layer, just has a hard limit. If it's more than three megabytes, it just won't do it. Open layers will try to accommodate you. That has a number of effects. Uh, one, you can actually add incredibly large KML files to your map. But that is at the expense of the amount of time it takes for open layers to download that KML file and bring it into your web browser. So this is the other, the other hazard that you have to be aware of when you're adding a KML file to your map. Because in contrast to Google, when you add a KML layer to Google, to your Google map, Google retrieves that KML file, 
and processes it on their servers and essentially layers the representation of that KML file on the map tiles that they're sending to you. So they're digesting and spitting out pictures of that KML file into your web client, into your browser. That's a very lightweight and simple way to add the KML in Google Maps to your map. It, 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 it adds almost no overhead in terms of the processing that your browser has to do, the processing that your computer has to do, or the data that your computer has to transfer over the web. None of that load is put on you. It's all um, you, uh, accepted by Google. Needless to say, that's one of the primary reasons why Google has that hard limit on the size of a KML file you can, you can bring in. Open layers, on the other hand, will let you bring in, and actually a couple of the KML files that I have in this are about 10 megs. So, you know, they're, they're examples potentially of what you shouldn't do, but they are an illustration of how, what you can do um, in terms of bringing KML data into the client. What's happening here, though, is that those files are actually being pulled across the network into your browser, and then being processed via JavaScript in your browser. So if you're working in a limited environment, so you're maybe working on a, cell, on a cell phone, or on a tablet with limited memory, or an environment where you don't have a lot of memory available for the browser, you could end up crashing a browser. Um, you could end up, if, if your client is connecting over a narrow network connection, you could have a situation where they can't even effectively download that entire KML file let alone render it. So it's something you have to think about when you're adding KML files to your maps. Open layers will try to do it, but you may not get a great outcome um, based on some of those size and complexity issues. With that having been said, this, um, this open layers uh, vector layer type supports a variety of models for interacting with vector data. And in this case, the, the general model is we give it a name. This is, again, the name that shows up in the client interface. We're setting the projection. We're defining a strategy where, in this case, this is essentially telling open layers how it should read the data and process the data for display in the client. Um, and then we're we're setting up a protocol where in this case we're accessing a remote KML file that's available over the internet. So we're telling open layers that it needs to actually retrieve the data for this vector layer over the internet and this is how to do it using the HTTP protocol. We've talked about that before in the context of requests that are sent to uh, any of the, uh, any of the uh, um, OGC web map services. It's the protocol that brought us the World Wide Web. Great stuff. You need to then, of course, provide the URL. Essentially, the absolute or relative reference for the data file that should be brought in. We talked earlier about relative and absolute uh, references when you're importing, say, JavaScript files or images into your web pages. The principle here is exactly the same. So if you have, in this case, a KML file called nmcounties.kml in the same directory as the web page that is, that is running this, you're golden, because that's where it's going to look. This is a relative reference to a file that is basically in the same directory as the web page that the, that the map is being put into. You can, of course, provide a path to another location or a full web address to a file that's located somewhere out on the internet. And we'll see examples of that in just a minute. So you are making up a new name, this URL, it's Well, what I'm doing here is, I, this is not a, I'm not making it up. This is actually a part of this, the definition of this protocol uh, it's, a, it's part of the value that's presented to this protocol um, that, this, uh, that this vector object requires. <coughs> so we're telling, we're telling that as we're creating this layer object, we need to get the data for this using a protocol. 
And more specifically, we're using the HTTP protocol and defining that HTTP protocol requires some additional information. Specifically, the URL, basically, where should that HTTP request be sent to? In this case, it's a relative resource, so it's saying look, at, look, at a lo look for a local file. But it could just as easily point to a location out on the web. Um, and then as a part of that, we're actually telling it what format we should be, we should be expecting. In this, term, in this case, we're telling it that we're going to be getting a KML file. And even that format option has some options as well. In this case, we're telling it to extract the attributes from that KML file so that, if, so that they're then available if we wanted to do some additional fancy you know, labeling or you know, info boxing or any of those other things so that we can read those out of the KML file itself and they're available to us. I don't go into that level of detail, but that's one of the options for essentially reading the information out of a KML file. So that's all creating this, this vector um, layer, and then we add that to the map. So let's see what this looks like in action. This should look somewhat familiar in terms of uh, you know, the examples we used previously for our Google Maps. Um, but in this case, uh, we're, uh, we're doing it in open layers. And in this case, we're actually using a different base map. Again, we're using this US imagery tile service, which is kind of crappy looking, zoomed in that, this close. But if we zoom out, it actually has, this, this turns out to actually be a very nice sort of base map uh, service um, as it supports a pretty wide range of scales as they've built in that, that intelligence into their imagery service so that as you zoom out, it, sh it shows essentially appropriate levels of detail. But that's sort of an aside. We zoom back in, we can see you know, this area of campus and where we're sitting right now. We can see that I've added this uh, polygonal area between Bandelier East and Bandelier West. We've added a small circle here where my office is, a larger circle here where our classroom is, and then we defined this, this uh, polyline that connects them. So these are three different types of geometries and, and different styles that have been defined for each of those geometries. Um, and again, I have, in this case, additional KML files that I have uh, included as optional layers in this map. So if I zoom out a little bit, I can, for example, turn on the county's KML file. And what it's doing now is it's actually retrieving the KML file from the server, loading it into the client, and eventually rendering it. That rendering in this case is done in the browser. So that's part of the overhead and part of the, the potential to crash a browser if it if it's, is resource constrained, if it doesn't have a lot of capacity. Doing something like this can break some browsers. And then I make it worse. I go ahead and add this cities layer. This is another KML file. So it's now downloading that into the browser and it's going to process it and display those features on the map as well. This is all happening in the browser based on a KML file that's being uh, retrieved remotely. And then if I zoom out a little bit more, I can request the state KML, state's KML file, which is actually just the state of New Mexico. Because I wasn't that greedy. <laughs> And you may have noticed the subtle, the subtle changes, the semi-transparent blueness of the state of New Mexico appeared. And you notice that the, my map, mapping has already slowed down. Um, that's because, again, I'm now asking the browser to figure out how to re-render the data from those KML files. <coughs> 
in the map as I interact with it. So you can start to see the effects of bringing those large KML files. In this case, the, uh, the county's file, I think, is about 10 megs. The city's KML file is two, uh, two or so, two to three megs. And the state's one is only like you know, 200, 300K or something. But you know, it's not chicken feed. So let's look at the code for this. You know, we have the standard process up here, creating these global variables. Nothing new. We're creating our, uh, our open layers map. In this case, I've actually uh, changed the number of available zoom levels for the map. Um, that's just one of the options. The default is 16. So if you're happy with 16, don't need to worry about it. I don't know, for some reason I decided I wanted to change it here. Oh, you, actually now I remember why. Because um, I wasn't able to zoom in close enough over the buildings within those default 16. I was constrained because it would only zoom in, you know, at you know, the south southeastern quadrant of the city and I wanted to get a little closer over the university. Um, but you can tune up those zoom levels as you like. We're adding that um, that uh, that US imagery uh, layer um, that's just the WMS layer. The one difference here is that you'll notice I've created this layers object up here. This is essentially a container variable that I'm putting all my new layers into by name so that I can process them as a part of that container instead of explicitly adding adding them. So I actually wouldn't necessarily even, I don't, I'm not even sure I'm using these layer names anymore as independent variables. So I'm here creating this container layers variable that I'm adding the layers into as I'm creating them. So here, when I'm creating this, this US imagery layer, I'm not just calling it US imagery, I'm actually saying layers dot US imagery, saying create this new layer object that is contained in this layers variable, okay? So it's just a packaging, really, where I can refer to them by name as a part of this layers object. Other than that, it's all the same for that WMS layer. So now I'm creating this local features layer and adding it to my map. This is essentially where I'm going to then add my custom features. So that I can then, so this is essentially a container for those indiv individual features that I'm going to create using that same pattern that I showed in the, in, the, in the lecture notes. So we're creating that local features layer and we're adding it to the map. We're then creating a bunch of styles. Um, the link to the styles uh, information is provided in the lecture notes. I encourage you to take a look at those to see some of the options that you have. But basically, these are named combinations of different aspects of how features should be displayed that you can then reuse, in this case, reuse them by name. OK? So I'm just creating you know, this red point style, a style for my counties, a style for my states, cities buildings, and my path. So again, I'm giving these meaningful names and then defining styles that I can then use at least once, but I can potentially reuse them as well. Here I'm now creating essentially my geometries, these coordinates that I need to use to build the, build the features. So I'm creating my classroom coordinate here, this point geometry, which is just a longitude and latitude value. I'm creating um, this coordinate for the office that again is just a point geometry with a provided longitude and latitude. This is where that same uh, transform function that we were using for that set center function could also be used here. So if you're working in a map coordinate system that is different from you know, say latitude, longitude, but you want to define your, your points in latitude, longitude because it's 
easier. You want it, don't want to do like CS to CS to convert into whatever map coordinate system uh, your map is in. You can use that same um, transform function that we had in some of those examples for set center to take a pair of longitude latitude values and convert them into the, the local uh, coordinate system. Here, since we're working in 4326, I'm just providing my longitude and latitude in as longitude and latitude. Here, I'm actually defining a linear ring, also known as a polygon, um, by defining a, a, a set of points. So I'm basically defining now a series of point objects, each of which defines a node in the polygon that is this linear ring. Linear rings close themselves. So um, you don't have to have the first and last point as a common point. They will automatically close, which is also something to keep in mind if you get something odd looking. Um, you may be missing a point that gives you the closure that you're looking for because it's basically going to define a closing line between your starting and ending point. But aren't there, in your map, aren't there different ways that those lines could go together? Is no, they go together in the order of the points. In the order of the points. Yep. So you're basically walking the perimeter of that linear ring and specifying <coughs> points along that path that you walk. Here we're defining our building path, the coordinates associated with our building path. And in this case, we're defining them as a line string. And here, we're actually um, using some of our previously defined points as part of the definition of this line string. So we're starting at the classroom. So I'm reusing that point geometry that I created up, that I created earlier, that is the location of the classroom, instead of de defining another point object from scratch. So I'm able to reuse it by referring to the name that I gave to that point geometry that I created up above. Now I'm creating two new point geometries along the path. And then I'm reusing that coordinate office point that I created up above. So this is a way to ensure, you know, if you want things to be co-located, define the point once, define the location once, and reuse it by name. So we've now created our geometries, but, that we, but so far that's all they are, is geometries. We now have to add them to our layer. Actually, before we even add them to our layer, we have to create the features. So here, we're creating four vector features. You'll notice that every one of these is just feature.vector. So from the feature perspective, Features can contain any number of different types of geometries. By the time you're talking about a feature, you're just passing it, you know, one of these line strings or points or linear rings or any of the other ge supported geometry types. All a vector feature is looking for is some sort of supported geometry. So in this case, we're passing we're creating a vector feature based on the classroom geometry. And to be honest, I forget what the second parameter is. I'd have to look at the documentation. And then I'm applying a style to it. So I define those styles up above, and I'm saying use this style, link this style to this feature. And I'm doing that for the office point for the um, linear ring for the, uh, the buildings, and in this case, applying the building style, and then the building path, and applying the path style. So in this case, I didn't actually apply the style to the office location, so I'm going to get a default point for that one. And then I'm adding features. So again, this is that, that container model for these layers. I have this layers container, and I'm referring to the local features by name as a part to get that particular layer out of that collection. 
And I'm, tell, and I'm saying I want to add features to it. What features do I want to add? The features that are included in this list that is provided. So now I'm adding these four features that I created here to my layer. So we now have four features that are in our layer. And those are now, since we've already added that layer to the map, those features are now visible in the map. Yep? I don't understand what the null is, though. I have to look to see what the null is. It's an option in between that wasn't essential to this, to, 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 uh, that I didn't have to set. I, I have to look. Um. <laughs> when I, and to be honest, as I'm working with any of this stuff, I've typically got a browser window open next to me that has all the documentation for the API. Mm -hmm. Because there are so many options and so many variations on the theme, I'm having to look it all up all the time. <laughs> um, here we're adding our KML layers. And I already pretty much walked through this process. Um, but it's, it's just as I described. We're creating this vector layer. We're defining the projection. In this case, the visibility is set to false so that it's not going to be displayed automatically, which is something you want, typically want to avoid with KML layers because if they're triggered on, if they're visible true, your browser is immediately going to start trying to download them. And it may be worthwhile to sort of delay that until the user actually wants to look at them. Um, I am applying a style. So I can apply a style to KML layers that you can define locally, which is in some contrast to some of the options and limitations you have in Google Maps. Um, and then we're creating this, uh, this strategy, this fixed strategy for the KML, which is the standard model for these KML files, defining our protocol. And the one thing I'll point out here is, in this case, our URL is pointing to a KML file that's out on the web somewhere. In this case, it's stored in Amazon's uh, storage system, S3. Um, as just a web accessible resource, so that's always an option. And we're telling it's a KML file, and we're having it extract the attributes, and then we're adding this layer. And we repeat that for each of those three KML files. We're then doing this simplified set center, adding a few mo more controls, and we're good to go. So this is, you know, this is a, a, a reasonable model to uh, look at for adding uh, your own data either as sort of homegrown in, in, in the code defined features and information related to those features or if you want to use an existing data set KML files are a handy way to do that keeping in mind all the limitations that I talked about a, a little bit ago. Um, you may find yourself wanting to bring some, a KML file into a map. You may want to work in, in another tool, another GIS or something else to generalize some of the geometries, to simplify them so that it, you know, I was dealing with this a while ago where we had North American watersheds that we wanted to bring into a, a Google map as, as uh, boundaries. Those started out life as uh, like 12 megabytes of KML. And in this case, we needed to get it, generalize them. In this case, we were using ArcMap down to simplified geometries that would, that would come in as a KML file that was less than two megs. That's something that you might consider if you want to use a KML file um, is using other sort of geospatial processing techniques to uh, simplify those geometries, squeeze that file down um, into something that's more manageable or breaking it into pieces. And, providing options to sort of incrementally load those pieces. 